This is a production of Cornell University. Yeah, we'll, we'll uh, get things started here. Uh, this is the last episode of our Cornell Church Show Spring Series, everybody. It's kind of turning into summer here up north, but um, episode 21, uh, thanks everybody for sticking with us, whether you're live or watching the recording, listening to the podcast. Our finale today is going to feature Dr. Chase Straw of Texas A&M University. Uh, today, Chase, uh, as you may remember from last year's series, uh, Chase is, is delved into the remote sensing on, on athletic fields, and we're going to talk about that today, player perception, how they move around, around the fields, uh, so we're interested for that conversation, of course. Uh, but as always, Frank, if you want to kick off, kick off our finale um, with, uh, yeah. as always, your news and notes from the past week. Yeah. I hadn't uh, hadn't thought about the fact that it is in fact a finale. Hey, Chase, congratulations! You get our. This is our twenty second show uh, since March, so we're really glad to have you here. Thanks for taking the time, and I understand you're working with a good upstate New Yorker with old Zeke Hurd. Oh yeah, yeah. All right, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, okay, okay. So 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 for now, uh, welcome to the show, and of course, uh, lots of pride down there in Texas, and we're all looking forward to. The big full stadiums again, and everybody being uh, healthy, vaccinated, and, and moving on with this situation. Uh, but for now, again, just to remind uh, all of you listening, watching, uh, got your headphones in, get your hands on what uh, folks in Maryland did, the Mid Atlantic uh, folks did with these best management practices. Of course, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago with Andy um, and, and his involvement in that. And I know Chase was involved in it as well. So it's just a wonderful publication. And one of the things I noticed is that there isn't much devoted to it for collecting data on uh, various aspects of things like we're going to talk about. Now, obviously, it's, you know, it's a volume one and it's and it was had particular needs, much like our golf one did. And you expect these things to be living documents. Uh, but boy, this was a monumental achievement uh, for, for this industry and big kudos to everybody. And, and a big shout out on the last day to, to all the women I know uh, in this business. You know, I think it's time we're trying to maybe normalize some things for people. And, and I can't help but thinking that, you know, when young women uh, see other women doing this work, it's the best way to sort of get them seeing and imagining themselves doing that work. I know for me, it was a big part of of my career development, there were people I looked at and, and imagined, you know, something that I liked and then saw somebody doing it and then imagining somebody who looked like me doing it. Now, it's not hard to find, you know, a white guy finding what I do. But for those of you women, for those of you like myself with daughters, Heather Nabosny there in Detroit, 1999, hired as the first female grads groundskeeper and, and one of my students uh, at Michigan State for the five minutes I was there, Amy Fowdy up at the top. Nicole Sherry, of course, one of the driving forces uh, behind the best management practices and down at the bottom, I believe this is Leah Withrow. She's out in uh, Nevada and she just got some acclaim recently. She rebuilt the field out there, oversaw the rebuilding of the field. So big shout out, you know, all these women in sports turf uh, management. I just think it's great. And, and uh, I know that they, that's a, that, these are not easy jobs. Uh, no, matter, no matter what sex or gender you are, this is, these are not easy jobs. All right, let's talk about the weather and and really just for those of you with us with golf, you know, rather than sort of rehash some things, just get into the with the dryness that we're experiencing, uh, really the lack of rainfall in the last week, but the pretty regular rainfall for most of us through the Northeast, particularly in our neck of the woods here, we've been getting a fair amount of rainfall. And of course, wherever Rich Buckley is, there's always guaranteed to be a little bit of rainfall. So more, a little rainfall in the metropolitan area, Long Island, a couple of dry spots in Philly. Uh, looks like further south you get, the drier it gets, and also up in Maine. Now, I encourage you to look at the drought monitor. Uh, it's not looking good moving forward. So this, this is what seems to be coming. Warmer weather, dry immediately. Carl, you know, it's in the 90s now uh, these past couple of days, and we're expecting maybe normal uh, to dry precipitation. I mean, you know, you know, you don't how much stock to put in some of these forecasting things. You try to keep it on your radar, but the trend now seems to be that we're looking a little dry up here compared to uh, our, our brethren down in the down in the south. Now, as we get into this really wonderful time for growing grass, you know, I got to tell you, uh, the heat, all the heat aside and the dryness aside, 
for a period of time there, it just seemed like, boy, if you didn't have good grass, maybe it was time to find a, another line of work. The temperatures were cool. The rainfall was plenty. The nights were still cool. And thankfully, we're still getting some cool nights uh, to help us out for sure. Uh, but understanding, you know, how uh, grasses are responding to growth um, and then recognizing that, you know, if you actually go out there and collected clippings, like Bill Kreiser did on this non-irrigated Kentucky bluegrass uh, turf in Nebraska in, uh, in 2014, um, you know, you can see that the, the growth potential predicted certain growth and the actual growth was pretty high uh, early on in the season, not much in the summer as expected, and then very bimodal. You can see this surge again uh, in the latter part of the season. Now, you look at irrigated tall fescue and you see something very different. Kentucky bluegrass, while it you know, seems to support the normal uh, bimodal cool season growth habit, you do not see that necessarily with irrigated tall fescue, not a significant growth uh, in the early part of the season. But as the heat build, um, you can see that growth was pretty steady. And then again, growth potential is indicating lots of growth here on this tall fescue, but they weren't actually seeing it. Now, this is an important point to keep in mind. One of the things we're talking about today is measuring things. You know, we're on this, we're very data centric, as Carl said to me this morning in our early morning conference call, uh, that we're very data centric here at Cornell. And when you look at this data, you see, well, if I was managing based on growth potential, I'd be thinking it's growing a lot more than it actually is. Maybe there's a way I should pay attention to the way it's growing. Now, of course, when it comes to mowing in sports fields, I really have always loved this uh, graphic from some work that Trey Rogers group did at Michigan State years ago looking at fertility and mowing height uh, and its effect on uh, traffic and maintaining acceptable turf cover, right? And, and, it, and it's very clear, everybody keeps saying it. We've heard it a number of times this year. You want grass to grow more, fertilizing it's one thing, but mowing it more also helps. Mowing definitely encourages density and you can see that density translates to more uh, games, simulated soccer games per week anyway. So theoretically, you know, by mowing more, you're going to be a little bit more traffic tolerant, provided you've got the nutrition there for the plants to do their thing. Now, let's get into the soil, right? Soil temperatures now are starting to move, we're starting to surge, right? All of a sudden, we went from spring to 90 degrees in four days. And the early indications are that the soils are warming rapidly. And what that means for many people in places where chemical pesticides are an issue where you can use them. And if you have chronic problems with soil borne things like fairy ring, summer patch, things like that, maybe on your Kentucky bluegrass, you might be doing fungicide drenches at these times. But the, one of the topics for today is managing surface hardness, right? So in it, that surface hardness in a golf course actually is a positive thing. And certainly we know it leads to uh, significantly more um, summer patch sometimes, uh, but in general, uh, you see when you airify, you put a little manganese on, you get pretty significant improvements in, in turf performance at the surface, right? So we know soil management in sports fields for surface hardness is going to be important, and you're going to get this added benefit if you don't have, you know, loose sand-based, well-drained fields, you're going to get this important benefit of not having these root pathogen problems, but also uh, maintaining really good, uh, healthy turf with good solid root system. Now, again, of the many things we're going to test, right, of the many things we're going to talk about today, obviously surface hardness is one of the things we hang our hat on a little bit. Uh, but before we get into our conversation with our guest today, I want to tell you, Chase, we, we talked to Evan Maschetti. We had, we had Evan on the show uh, early on about five weeks ago, and we were, uh, this particular article caught my fancy, where he's taking data, you know, as a former groundskeeper, now working with Andy, uh, he was taking data on where balls get hit, MLB looked at how they got hit, uh, the preponderance of these things, and how that might affect uh, surface hardness. Now, recently, I think it's really cool, you know, who would pay attention to a picture like this, but a, a major league baseball groundskeeper. This is Nicole Sherry taking pictures of Camden Yards skinned infield. And, and boy, if this isn't ever the idealized version of how a skin should behave, uh, I don't know if I've ever seen one. What a, this will be a picture for the archives, honestly. 
Uh, that cleat in, cleat out with very little chunking. You know, when we talk about playing surface management, for those of you in the baseball world managing these surfaces, obviously understanding what your target is, is going to be important. Now, this is a qualitative, by every measure, a qualitative assessment, right? You're looking, you see that the cleat's going in and out. We're not really taking a piece of data like Evan is doing here, maybe on hardness. So uh, the, the ground staff at the Maryland Soccer Complex uh, really probably, in my opinion, certainly puts out some of the most progressive stuff on, into social media. And here's a picture of some uh, drone work that they did, uh, just looking at remote sensing and where some of the hot spots that might not be visible uh, to the naked eye on the field, but you can see are, are quite a bit significant. You can see a few hot spots uh, around the field. And again, a, a really a qualitative, uh, you, you're, maybe it's NDVI and you know, there's always a scale. We don't know what it means. And so you, looking at this, you'd say, well, you know, I know I got goal mouth and down the middle issues, but boy, I didn't realize I had that issue in the corners of the field. You know, I didn't see the turf thinning over there necessarily. So uh, they've gone in and, and used that imagery uh, to improve maintenance practices. They did uh, uh, a sand slit uh, drilling uh, practice on these soccer fields. They got acres and acres of them out there. It's a a massive operation uh, down there in, in, in Maryland. I think it's, I think it's outside of Baltimore. Um, they've also, of course, uh, drone pictures of when things are going good. They've done some phrase mowing over the years uh, to improve the playing surface. So very progressive in their thinking of how they do that. But Chase, now, as you and I start to chat about these things, right, you and I live, you know, mo both feet in the academic world most of the time. And you, you know, as a 70% researcher, I know you spend an enormous amount of time teaching like Richard White used to do. And um, this is your work with, with uh, Gerald Henry. I thought it's where I want to talk a little bit about this as we finish up my intro here, but for sure, the dry down thing is going to be important for us to talk about today because, uh, you know, we're expected to be dry and, and you know, organized sports are back uh, in, in earnest. Now, the other component of this that, you know, Carl and I talk about this all the time because we have some interactions with our coaches and athletes, sometimes on golf, sometimes on soccer, sometimes on football, sometimes on field hockey, sometimes on lacrosse. You ask them lots of different questions. I talk to trainers. It's all ad hoc, nothing, nothing actual. And, and yet you did this study. Uh, looking at these, uh, how athletes perceive these things. So I want to talk a little bit about athletes perception. And of course, you got some wonderful data here on, on surface hardness and, and, you know, basically heat maps, cold, not so bad, maybe red, uh, not so good. And the other thing I want to throw in the mix today, Chase, is, is this, of uh, this idea of synthetic maintenance, uh, synthetic turf care and synthetic turf testing. Now this is, you know, quite a bit more specified in the ASTM lingo than the natural field uh, bit, uh, baselining, benchmarking, testing is. And you know, McElroy's wrote that review paper a number of years ago on the various ways of testing fields. And you know, synthetic turf uh, as well, you know, I think oftentimes, you know, we, we put it, you know, it gets GMAX testing, it's getting some testing, but also how do we adapt and adjust to that testing and how do athletes uh, perceive any differences on synthetic turf? So. The questions for the, you know, the you know, our discussion today, Dr. Shaw, uh, uh, you know, include these, you know, wh wh why do we test uh, and, and why do we test things when we can see them? I, I see the turf is worn out. You know, what do I need to spend money, you know, taking all this data and, and, and okay, I, I see it's variable. I got a native soil field. I, I understand it's important, but what am I supposed to do for management? You know, I got, oh, I got uh, I got just a couple of uh, I got just a couple of folks working with me. Um, how variable, if you know, is synthetic turf, and then we'll get to the dry weather and, and variability. I did. You do know this is the fastest thirty minutes in turf, right, Chase? So oh, we, got, yeah. we got a lot to cover. Already taking half of it. Yeah, that's right. That's good. So, so let's start with um, what do you say to people when they say, "What do I got to test for? I can see it." Well, you know, that's the most common question, obviously, right? We have all this data, especially in sports fields. You know, golf, from a management standpoint, we can see a huge reduction in inputs with targeted management practices. In sports turf, you know, you don't see that big reduction in inputs, so it's all player safety, essentially, right? I mean, that's why we're doing it. 
And, uh, you know, the biggest answer that I have to that question is, is consistency. I mean, that's our goal. We want a consistent sports field. And you can't put a value on your eyeballs. You can know how green the grass is visually, but, but you can't, you don't have a target. You don't have a threshold to guide your management. And that's essentially why you collect data, right? If it's surface hardness, it could be NDVI, but surface hardness is one you've talked about a lot. If you're going out and you're measuring surface hardness, if you're communicating with your coaches and your athletes, and you have an understanding of what level of hardness they prefer the field at, then you can manage your field to meet their expectations. Um, you know, that's, that's why you do it, essentially, on a sports field. Now, if you have a large complex, then that's when the whole precision turf management aspect comes in, right? Uh, we have a complex here locally that has anywhere from eight full-size grass soccer fields, six synthetic six fields. So if you're able to go out and test those fields regularly, then you can start identifying how the different fields interact between each other. And then you can maybe be a little bit more targeted with how your traffic or your use of the fields uh, are or just specific management. Um, I how great- much time does it take? How, I mean, you know, oh, I don't have enough guy. How much time? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. <laughs> I mean, seriously. That's right. 10, 10 minutes on a football field. That's exactly uh, right. It's intimidating the first time you do it. You've never done it before, just like anything else. But once you've done it, uh, you get a system down. It, it's 10 minutes if you follow the ASTM standard. Very simple. Less than, it's around 10 data points per field. You know, so really simple. Okay, so the key with data, and I, you know, Carl and I, of course, we're we're just loving this. This is exactly the way we think about targets versus thresholds, and yet we talk about having consistency, and we know there's variability, and you've done this with players. What did you find in your sensitivity analysis? Do they sense when their foot isn't safe? Can they inherently have an idea of their motion? And if it's safe to do, will they adjust how they play based on some perceived thing that unless you do this, what you're sort of promoting this intense, you know, data collection, how, how would you even know how to manage it? So tell me a little bit about sensitivity and then adjusting your management accordingly. Yeah. So, so the, the study that you pointed out where we interviewed athletes is a study that I did in Georgia. Right. And we interviewed 25 athletes, rugby and soccer athletes, primarily ultimate Frisbee was thrown in there too. very unique individuals, ultimate Frisbee players. Of course. Uh, so we took them out to the, the, uh, the field that they all play on the same field. And we asked them, take us to your perceived best and worst location in the field. And then we asked them, how do you perform differently or do you perform differently when you're in the field? And so that's where we, we did the hotspot maps that you showed here in, in the slide. Mm-hmm. And the vast majority, I mean, high 80s, 90% of people took us to those red blobs or those blue blobs, either the highest or the lowest surface hardness, for example. And they said that these are the areas that I, I perceive when I'm playing the game. And mentally, it does affect the way that I perform. Um, now, obviously, we couldn't quantify that in that study, but it still was an eye-opening, experience, an eye-opening thing for us that these these hot spots matter to the athletes so we should it basically justifies we should manage those areas differently to make them not not an issue right so in minnesota was when we started incorporating the uh wearable sensors and this is where a lot this is this is the fun stuff this is where a lot of uh a lot of the direction of uh the work that i'm doing now where we've strapped some gps sensors on athletes so we know where they are in the field we know how fast they're running uh, we know accelerations, decelerations. We can see the top speed, how fast they're running. And we've incorporated that data, the speed data, speed and distance data with some of our field measurements. And what we've found so far with uh, rugby players and soccer players is when they're in the wettest part of a field, they run slower, which is what we could probably, or they run, they run, uh, yeah, they run slower in the wettest part of the field. And when in there, they're in the highest in DVI. So the highest turf quality, they run slower. So, you know, big in Big Ten country, you know, they always mow that Kentucky bluegrass really high. Right. So if Northwestern comes to town, or if Ohio State's coming to town with Northwestern, they kind that's of right. crank the, that mowing height up to slow them down. And, you know, that's what I think the, the, the context is there while we're seeing the data. But it's a way that we can quantify the way that they're performing now. So 
these GPS devices are becoming really uh, common. They're even trickling down to the high school. They're pretty affordable. So if you're interacting with a performance coach or an athletic trainer that has that data and you're telling them how you're managing your field and they're starting to see trends in how they're performing, then you can really use that data as well to, to manage your field. It's so uh, ironic, right, Carl? We just did this with golfers with the Deacon, uh, USGA Deacon thing. We just had... Carl's passed out almost 200 sensors recently for the same thing. And you are exactly right when you say in golf, we're using it to utilize less resources. Consistency, of course, matters as well. But in your case, you're exactly right. It's really, a, it really becomes a, about safety. And again, for those that think, oh my God, I got one guy. It's like, well, you got one guy, you got a two acre soccer field. Uh, now you've just described chase away i could probably manage if you look at that paper maybe a quarter 25 percent of the field surface i have to do something a little bit extra beyond mowing you don't have to do it to the whole surface how much do you number one do you see people doing that in your life now and number two um obviously you want to go back and test those areas again talk to those athletes again to see if what you've done actually remedies the issue. Yeah. 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 The biggest, I've only seen people do goal mouths in soccer. Uh, and then obviously in the middle of a football field, they'll, they'll hit the, you know, between the hats. Um, but I don't, we don't know if, it, if there's a benefit to that really. And so I have a graduate student right now that is taking surface hardness maps and we are doing site specific verification to see if over a, a long period of time, it'll be a two year study. Are we able to maintain a more uniform surface with respect to surface hardness uh, as if a blanket approach? Because I always give the example, if you have a football field, you know in the middle of the football field is the hardest part of the field. Yeah. If you do a blanket verification, you have, you have really hard spots in the middle and the hash marks, you have soft spots on the wings. You do a blanket verification, you're just decreasing both areas surface hardness. And then that middle of the field is gonna get trampled. So you're increasing the variability. You do another blanket, middle of the field again. Over time, you're just you're creating this huge issue in the middle of the field. Huh. Never actually thought about it that way, but yeah. it does make me think about a nice transition to synthetic turf where you got rubber. Yeah. And Andy was on a couple of weeks ago yakking about this. And you know, he doesn't like to talk about it. He doesn't like to be told he's like the world expert, him and <laughs> yeah. him and Soraka, but he actually is. And, yeah. Uh so so and I actually think it's a good thing, something that you should be proud of because it's important that we understand these things. So how about rubber stuff? You, have you done anything playing around with these surfaces that indicate they're more or less variable than a native soil or a sand? I have not done much comparison between a grass field and artificial turf, but we have. So I actually did a study. I helped write it with John. Can I share my screen? I'll show a pretty cool. Go right one. ahead. Carl, you want to give him the host? Yeah, I think he should be able to. Let's see if you can do that, Chase. So we just published this in, uh, earlier this year. Oh. Let's see here. Um, and what we did was uh, John actually did all the hard work. So this is. This is 12 artificial turf fields, all ranging from, so there's field one all the way to field 12, and then all ranging in different ages. So we, we went from one month old field all the way to 10 year old field. And this top half was surface hardness. And as you can see, it was a really interesting trend that we found with these 12 fields. They're all in North Georgia or South Tennessee. They would get harder and more variable as they got older which is really interesting. And it was a significant relationship between surface hardness and infill depth, where as they got older, they would lose infill depth and become more harder in certain areas. So yeah, when you talk about artificial turf fields, they, they aren't maintenance free. And if you don't, there's this whole thing of runaway rubber, right? They, they get in the shoes of the kids or they get kicked out to the side. You know, that's, I think that's critical for the longevity of an artificial turf field is to, to ensure that that crumb rubber is, is uniform across the field uh, for the duration of its lifetime and, and replacing it. So, you know, you could use some of these kind of maps to identify areas where you might be low uh, and then, you know, replace the rubber in those areas and hopefully improve the surface hardness uniformity with those 
So, so let me ask you to speculate here. Take the work you did where you strapped the, you not strapped the GPS, but you asked the athletes to take you to places on the field. Is it your sense that, I mean, I can tell you, I meet young people teaching classes all the time, Chase. And I teach uh, sections to different things about synthetic turf. Almost all of them have said they've never played on natural grass. This is all they've ever played on. Is there a sense they can determine the same variability on these rubber surfaces, you think, that they can on these grass native soil surfaces? I don't think so. Unless it's an extreme, unless it's a new field versus a really old field, you know, I think it's kind of it's hard to detect, the, especially the within field variability aspect. But yeah. there's not a lot of research on that. So actually, That's one right. of my graduate one of my graduate students right now is we're moving from the GPS sensors on the back to uh, inertial. They're inertia measurement units that go around the ankle. So we can, when the athlete's running, we can measure loads that are returned back to them. So we're taking the whole concept of the, the hotspot maps that you've shown, and we're setting up agility trials within the field based on the hardest and softest areas and having them perform certain uh, maneuvers within those areas to determine if they're doing anything different within and even between the fields. So we have a grass field and an artificial turf field. Yeah, yeah. And listen, we're not going down the wormhole of footwear, but we all know footwear is a significant aspect of what performance is. In fact, it can overcome even, even uh, tall grass. Good footwear, good spikes is, is probably, that's how the Packers beat everybody. They used to have thick, uh, thicker spikes. So listen, let me wrap up by asking the last question I had on there for, for sort of current event stuff. And you did the dry down work, right? A lot of native soils, right? Uh, obviously, we're expe we're going to expect some dry weather, and and there's not a lot of, you know, it's it's not common to find heavy use fields that aren't necessarily a quality that are irrigated in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit different than down south, where maybe they're more irrigated fields because of the length of the seasons and for whatever reason. Um, we get into dry patterns. What would you tell people? In a, you know, we're, we were talking earlier about surface hardness and coring. What about uh, hosing? Should you drag a hose? I mean, you don't got time for it, but is what did you find when you looked at dry down that informed maybe something you'd tell people as they're facing dry weather looking forward? Well, community level sports fields, as anybody who manages them knows, you know, they get hard when they're dry, really hard. <laughs> So the key is to just maintain cover. I think the biggest thing is to communicate with whoever's using your field and make sure that you're able to spread that traffic out because having cover there is going to really help with the hardness and the safety of the field, I believe. I'm a huge proponent of wetting agents. And, you know, maybe that's not uh, a possibility for some places, but, I mean, they have the tabs. You can stick the wetting agent tabs on the hose. Mm -hmm. You know, help kind of retain some of that water in the, in the, in the surface if, if, if at all possible. Yeah, it yeah. definitely isn't common to see a lot of sports field managers use wetting agents. And even Andy, Andy McNitt made a bold statement a couple of weeks ago. He said, I don't think people should have, I don't think scholastic people should have sand-based fields uh, yeah. because they don't know how to manage them. They're harder to manage. Yeah. And, and the yeah. other thing he said was good is, is, you know, put all your resources and have one really good field right? Versus taking your resources and trying to spread them out and having a bunch of halfway fields. But that does beg to some consistency differences, right? You got one really good game field that you play on, but you're practicing on, ooh, maybe some variability. These are really probably intentional conversations people, these guys need to start having, folks need to start having with their athletes. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, certainly. Okay. Carl, it's the witching hour. Look how fast that went, Trace. How about questions? Uh, are there any questions? I think that one that, that comes to mind for me, Frank, is, you know, we're doing this work with golfers, tracking their movements, and, and we find a big problem between golfers' perception of the putting surfaces versus reality. What, what can they actually detect? Sometimes they tell us, and it's really not different. Sometimes they don't notice. It's a lot different. So, Chase, you've done this stuff, uh, the perception side of it, and now you're actually tracking them with these uh, inertial units. Um, are you noticing any disconnect there? Um, I know. I know you mentioned. Okay, they kind of run slower in the the greener spots and and the softer spots. Uh, what kind of is that variability limit to to what they can actually detect? 
Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. And we haven't gotten into the GPS data that in that detail yet, but I will say that, the, so we did the injury study, I think that you all are familiar with, where we, in the same study, using the same athletes where we did the hotspot maps and the interviews, and we tracked injuries over two years with those athletes. And we found that injuries were happening, happening along the edges or the transitions of an athlete moving to high and low areas. And, you know, I thought that was really interesting because whenever we interviewed the athletes, they always took us to the middle of those kind of hot spots, like the worst of the worst. But they're, and they said some of them, you know, the vast majority actually said that during a game, I probably wouldn't change how I'm, how I, how I move in some of these areas. And I think with the psychological aspect of they wouldn't change how they move and they're trying to exert a lot more energy in these really unsafe areas. That might be why we're seeing the, uh, even though they said that they won't change, that might be why we're seeing the injuries because they actually do change or they don't change and they get hurt because they have like a misstep or something. That's right. They get, yeah. they, 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 they yeah. get confused because these, yeah. the, the reaction times and twitching of these athletes' muscles yeah. is, I mean, that's why they're high performance athletes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chase, it, yeah, it's so great chatting with you. Uh, we could do another 20 minutes, but. I wish I would have left a little more time. I tried to set you up a little good. Can you, uh, Carl, we got to make sure we get that link to that nice synthetic turf paper. I missed that one. Uh, that's definitely something we want to talk more about. Chase, I hope you have a yeah. wonderful growing season down there, buddy, and it dries out for you. Yeah, same to you. It, it should. It will one day, and then we'll wish for some rain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, thanks, uh, Frank, Chase, of course, for, for coming on. Uh, thanks to our live viewers who have been here most of the way you guys uh who have come to almost every episode thanks to you guys thanks to everybody listening it's been uh it's been a joy to, to put this on for for 10 11 weeks i guess here in the spring uh frank and i might come back in the summer we might do a couple we'll, we'll see here or there pop up yeah a little pop up webinar here and there so look out for that uh but until then thank you everybody this has been the cornell turf show spring series uh we'll see you all very soon this has been a production of cornell university on the web at cornell.edu.